Why hide something like that? Why ignore it? Why not stop it? And this time, let's not say I use the Jews as a sacrificial pawn, okay? I just personally am not a fan of that tactic and it didn't work, so. Making this video really changed my view on the world. The anti-Semites are a danger to all of us because anti-Semitism is the tool of totalitarian expansion. That's what anti-Semitism is, and it has been that for a very long time. And this phenomena is probably going to grow to a monster size unless we fight now. We have to fight now. Five years have seen an increase in anti-Semitic violence around the world. We're seeing increased violence against Jews. The survey found a 10% increase of Jewish respondents who consider themselves less secure than a year ago. And as the Jewish community was reeling from that, these hateful flyers were reported on residents' doorsteps in Westwood, Brentwood, Beverly Hills, and Bel Air early Sunday. There is a clear trend in the young America that is very anti-Jewish. There is a growing pressure to address those sentiments. Also, they get most of their information from TikTok, and we don't know how to deal with that. One of the biggest steps, the transition from an underground movement to a mainstream movement has already taken place. And that brings us to United States' current position. F up Israel slowly but surely. Too bad the frustrated mob is just, it ain't satisfied. It's not enough. It really wants to see some Jewish blood down, streaming down the street as soon as possible. Well, in 1945, we said never again. This isn't going to happen ever again. But it is happening. The same people with the same ideas are shouting for the genocide of the Jews and the destruction of the state of Israel in Germany, in France, in the Netherlands, in Sweden, and on American campuses. He alone who owes the youth against the future. The ideology that saw Jews as a problem started in the academia. One must remember that the ideas that, that Hitler came to believe, eugenics, for example, or anti-Semitism, were, they, were, they were open source. They were globally available. Anybody could believe these things because they had been very respectable. The same thing is happening in all universities in the United States. Everybody is looking at Harvard now. And it pains me. It pains me to have to say, sadly, that Jew hate and anti-Semitism is thriving on this campus. Jews are turned into persona non grata. They are not wanted there. I was forced to leave my study group for my doctoral exams halfway through the semester because my group members told me that the people at the Nova Music Festival deserved to die, faculty dismissing student concerns for their safety by telling them that if they are scared, they should just go back to Israel. Wait, 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 wait. Guys, y'all taking it way too far. The media. Hold my beer. There's been a dangerous new development that makes you question who's who here? Of extremist Jews who disguise themselves as Palestinians to get around a ban on non-Muslims praying in the Al-Aqsa Mosque compound. Oh no, the Jews are trying to pray. Hello, everybody. Jews! I know that fewer people are won over by the written word and by the spoken word and that every great movement on this earth owes its growth to great speakers and not to great writers. Those who were the first to understand how to utilize the new media, movies, videos, to generate propaganda and influence the masses were those anti-Semites. And today they were the first to understand how to use social media for the same purpose, to generate and embed those ideas that Jews are less than or that Jews are evil in our collective mindset. And for the record, everybody is affected, Jews included. The anti-Semitic parasitical psychopaths are in a demonic class of their own. And back then we were like, okay, those are trolls. 100% Ashkenazi Jewish. That's, that's the new determination. This can't possibly be good for me with the anti-Semites who watch the program and comment on YouTube and send me those lovely love tweets that I get every single day. It was not trolls. It was real. This is how people think.
when the universities were confronted about the situation that they have, this is what they had to say. At Harvard, does calling for the genocide of Jews violate Harvard's rules of bullying and harassment, yes or no? It can be, depending on the context. And this is how the media responded. Anti-Semitism, yay or nay? <laughs> I'm sorry, what? Yes or no is calling for the genocide of Jews against the Code of Conduct for Harvard. Well, it depends on the context. Incredible, isn't it? This ethic uncoupling that ar arises uh, amongst the educated Germans that is the most striking feature, I think, of the story. I thought that active anti-Semitism, the one that we saw with Germany, for example, is not really possible. So what made me change my mind? This video. There's money for arms and weapons to fight back against the Jews, operations against the Jews, but around the world, in, in France, in Germany, here, in Britain, wherever they are, but here and in Europe, we want to raise arms so we can strike them all over the world. We have to hit these people hard. Yeah. And we want to fund operations against soft targets. Uh, schools, hospitals, Jewish cafes, hospitals, s Jewish schools, Jewish buses, synagogues, that kind of thing. Targets that can make them really feel it, attack, blow things up, blow shit up. Gotcha. Okay, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah. we have to strike back. Yeah, we can't no, I definitely agree. All we have are rockets and suicide bombers and that kind of thing. The suicide bomber. Because it's like part of their religion, like they want it to take over. People are evil in these, these worlds, so you know what I mean? They. That's why we have, to we have to strike back. Reasons. Yeah, most definitely. So you think it's economic or you think it's the religion motivating them? Mm, I think it's a mix. Keep it's tax deductible. A couple bucks. Like five. Also five? Like five dollars. Five bucks? But yeah, five, ten. Probably like five bucks. Five bucks is great. Ten. Ten? Yeah, like five to ten. Oh, yeah. Like fifteen dollars. Say fifteen dollars. That'd be a fifteen, twenty dollars. Twenty dollars. Twenty bucks. I did twenty. Twenty bucks. Or thirty. 28 out of 35 people that I engaged in conversation with expressed support for what I was doing. And 17 out of 35, nearly 50% of people I spoke with, offered me money to kill Jews. All right, I guess violence is on the table. And not just good old racism. Not that not being allowed into clubs or hotels or living in certain areas were, was ever fun. Yes, and that was something that was happening to the Jews in the United States until the 1960s. So it's not that far-fetched, but it's not violence, you know. And here we see that there is a chance, a real chance, for physical attacks to occur with that kind of mindset. We will liberate the land! Is I guess I should have known. People are chanting globalized the Intifada, guess the Jews, but I didn't know how much the progressives that chant that with the Islamists understand what they're saying. But I guess they did. The German catastrophe is the hardest uh, of all problems because the worst event, the Holocaust, arises in a quite advanced society, which had the best universities in the 1920s, which had the highest uh, rates of intermarriage between Jews and non-Jews of any country, uh, which was generally recognized to be at the forefront of, of technological and, and scientific advance. And yet, and yet Hitler, and yet the Holocaust. The Holocaust did not start from the Russian peasants that were pogroming the Jews. It started and emerged in a liberal society. So what gave them that interesting idea to eliminate the Jews? And I said, so what are we going to do? And the supervising dean said, we're going to do nothing about it. And when I said, why are we not going to work on anti-Semitism? It's a clear issue. I was told that Jews are white oppressors. It was always just, you know, this is the truth. And if you don't agree, you know, you're not welcome here. Lee, just resign. That It'll be like this never happened. But then I felt like there were people who were being very unprofessional bullies and gangsters in an, a learning environment and I felt like they had done this before and they would just keep doing it. Once I went public, hearing from people across the nation that it wasn't just California or something weird. Right. This is happening all over the place, Glenn. So many Jews in Hollywood. Um, famous topic. And historically, it goes back to um, that's all they could do. A theater was the fine arts and Jews weren't allowed. And that generic wholesome, unidentifiable American, part of what I think they wanted to become, having fled uh, Eastern Europe and the pogroms. So they wanted a booming business that nobody would really pay too much attention to where they came from spiritually or 
or ethnically. The vast majority of American Jews, not the vast, but a large number of American Jews are Ashkenazi. They're of Eastern European descent. They look like me. They look white. They're white passing. Therefore, they benefit from white privilege. Therefore, they are white. Therefore, they are part of the oppressed, the opp excuse me, the oppressor category, despite 3,000 years of history that would indicate otherwise. This connects to your question because if Jews are understood to not just be in the oppressor side of the spectrum, but indeed something like uber white people, then it stands to reason that a lot of people who have bought into this ideology will come to see them as nefarious. Woke are just confused. The Nazis from the scary ones. Oh, my sweet summer child, what do you know about fear? Let's talk about the AI. The AI is the loophole that allowed foreign powers to wreak havoc inside the American society and, to be honest, around the world. So diversity, diversity is just a code name, let's say, for critical race theory. And equity is just a code name for communism. And inclusion is just a code name for authoritarianism. And, of course, like everything in life, you can look at the same thing and say, okay, that's the bright side and the dark side. So what I just mentioned, those were the dark sides, right? If we think about it like on the bright side, like we believe in their goodness, they just wanted equality, they just wanted uh, people to feel safe, and they just wanted people to feel represented. That's nice, that's good. So diversity. In its principle, it's meant so that every aspect of society would have a fair representation. For example, in the academia, 50% needs to be women, 50% needs to be men, and so on and so forth. And unfortunately, it's like slipping into like the absurd territory where half of the mother mothers have to be men. It also takes into account culture. And it thinks that every culture needs to be represented equally. Multiculturalism is an insistence that the particular cultures found among less fortunate groups are not to be blamed for disparities in income or education or crime rates, but are on net positive. But the problem is that the culture really affects the merit and the upbringing of a person. Ideally, yeah, you want to have like 50% of the population is black, then 50% should be mass or minus the amount of black people that you'd have, whatever. And a lot of it is like in the universities, like a lot of the fighting, for example, in the elite universities is that Jews are very overrepresented and they want to bring down the number or like the percentage of Jews so it would be reflected in society, which ignores the amount of work that Jews put in education since they're like very, very literal and they did it for centuries now. It doesn't work. It doesn't work if you want to see an example of a country that functions in that way and is now on a brink of a bankruptcy and total collapse is Lebanon. So yeah, if you're inter interested in learning some history, I can tell you that this is how Lebanon was created with a diversity fun function in mind. Every part of the population has to be presented exactly in the parliament and everything. It's a disaster, okay? <laughs> Equity, unless you don't view communism as something dark and you claim that ever, all the communism attempts that happened thus far are not real. Well, just think about it. Like in communism, the main principle is to give all the power, all the assets of the state to the state. And the state are just people. So there are people who hold all the power. It's concentrated. By definition, for those who fight power-based societies, communism doesn't make, make sense at all. Inclusion is having every person feel comfortable in the room, which is another way of saying control your mouth, which is another way of saying no free speech for you. Beautiful. Yeah. Maybe the bright side would be learning empathy. I think that's a skill you need to approach in a completely different way. Another interesting part that is that race theory and everything like that, that came out of the equity side, actually. I feel like everyone that has the ability to go to like a college or a university definitely has a different level of privilege that as of like compared to someone like can't afford to go to a college. 
Okay, race. but now go to white people. Abolish the white race. Harvard Magazine, October 2002. The person who brought up the abolishing the white race idea and everything like that was Noel Ignatiev, who was a Jew, of course. We always bring the best worst ideas. And he grew up in a very not racist home, just the way he describes it. He went to the pool that is meant for colored people, so all his friends were blacks. And then he tried to get a degree in university and got left after three years in the University of Pennsylvania. So he wasn't too idiot, like he wasn't too not smart, but he couldn't finish. In 1985, Ignatiev was accepted to the Harvard Graduate School of Education without an undergraduate degree. And he worked in a factory for 20 years and he was a revolutionist there. Like he would organize uh, strikes and he would cause mayhem and he actually also like vandalized a black worker's car because he uh, decided to not go with the flow of this demonstration against the owners of the factory. He wrote a book that is called How the Irish Turned White. And of course, the Irish were always slaves, always, always slaves. They were under the feudal system in Ireland. They didn't occupy anything. They were not colonizers. But in the United States, they turned white because they were white passing. But it actually took a long time for them to turn white. So he wrote a book about it where he claimed that the whiteness has nothing to do with biology or skin color or anything. It's a social construct, a concept that makes it easier to divide the working class. All concept of race needs to be abolished, so just that you can fight together for workers' rights and there wouldn't be a situation where one person might be tempted by benefits that a different person won't have because of something like their skin color. That's it. And when it turned into this whole race theory thing and white, white people need to be uh, punished for being slave owners, even though most of them probably weren't even in their past, but whatever. History is not important here. He was thinking about the workers, not about the elite. He didn't care about the elite. The elite was the enemy. So the elite now having this, uh, using his language to promote themselves is like, he didn't like it at all. The black race is the most advanced race to ever walk the planet. Race is such an obsession in the United States, it, and it's always have been an obsession in the United States. But it's also bullshit because the United States is made out of minorities. Nobody has really the amount of power that is needed to have a racial hierarchy, like a real one. The whites have carried to this colonial people the worst that they could carry. The plagues of the world, materialism, fanaticism, alcoholism, and syphilis. Moreover, since what these people possessed on their own was superior to anything we could give them, they have remained themselves. The sole result of the activity of the colonizers is they have everywhere aroused hatred. Adolf Hitler. <laughs> Look at this article from Al Jazeera and it's really important because this is an example of how foreign powers that have a completely different agenda from the people who came up with a DEI ideology, right? When foreign powers take that mindset and then start to manipulate it to turn white people, for example, or like Western, the Western ideologies, the, the Western world into this demon, it's really easy to do. Abolishing whiteness has never been more urgent. The white race is a club which enrolls certain people at birth, 
without their consent, and brings them up according to its rules. For the most part the members go through life accepting the benefits of membership, without thinking about the costs. When individuals question the rules, the officers are quick to remind them of all they owe to the club, and warn them of the dangers they will face if they leave it. This is exactly what is happening in the city of Colombia as even more recent members of the white club, such as those of Indian and East Asian heritage, have joined in opposing desegregation efforts, despite the historical and ongoing prejudice against them. One of the biggest pet peeves I personally have is how every country does that, right? It's not just the US or anywhere else. It's like we all like focus on our history. And when we focus on our own history, we also focus on our own faults. And there are cultures out there that don't do that, okay? That don't focus on their own faults. But there are other cultures like, for example, Germany. They do focus on their faults, okay? So they might believe that blonde people are inherently evil when they're not because they don't have an opposite example. And those who write those, Al Jazeera, when it wrote that article, it knew exactly what it was doing, because it knows the truth. While whiteness in its avatar, Western civilization, have for centuries declared themselves to be the epitome of enlightenment and freedom, historians have demonstrated not only the historicity of whiteness and its contingency, but that whiteness emerged directly and almost exclusively through its connection to imperialism, colonialism, slavery, genocide, and modern-day racism. No. White people are not responsible for every bad thing that happened in the world. Slavery was very, very popular in Africa way before white people got there. And also it is still popular in Africa right now. And there, and it has nothing to do with, with whiteness at all. The Cambodian genocide was not conducted by white people or white supremacists. And in the, the genocide in Rwanda, for example, was also not done by white people. So that's just ridiculous. 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 And it just sits on the fact that most people don't learn history that has nothing to do with them. And it makes them vulnerable to stupidity. There's too much going on. There's people. There's my people are dying in the streets, getting hung. And you're going to say that. Bye. Bye. By who? Literally by who? Because when I look at the data, when I look at the receipts, I know that I am more likely to be struck down by lightning than to be killed by a white police officer. So what do you think Al Jazeera is trying to do here? Resigned this year, a record number! <laughs> Only somebody who would try to break a society would bring those kind of ideas so hardcore into the American mind. There is another reason why that hate that was built by intellectual means to reach a certain goal is so dangerous. And why when you use means like propaganda to perpetuate hate towards a group, it is way more dangerous than when you are just xenophobic or just racist. The more educated the population is, the harder it is, and the bigger the lies and the propaganda and the evilness of the claim has to be. So the conspiracy, the work that, that you have to put in is so profound that it completely changes the personality of the person you are brainwashing. What was the lesson? That's the question. And the lesson is, you're the Nazi. Like the Japanese, they were fundamentalists. The Germans, they were fundamentalists. The trauma they had to go through, that was the only way for them to be like, wait, maybe it's not worth it. Maybe those ideas, those ideals are not worth it. And when you are brainwashed and you start understanding that something is wrong with what you were taught, but you already did so much, so and, and you caused so much pain for something that is wrong, 
you want to protect your psychology and you want to keep going that way just so you can have your mental health intact. For a person to, to stop believing in that thing, they have to go through an extreme trauma. Sometimes it has to be an extreme trauma. The trauma in Europe, for example, was so big, they have phobia from xenophobia now. And that really hurts them. Because sometimes Europe, stranger, is danger. After so many years of war, it's understandable. French against English, Catholics versus Protestants, everyone against everyone. It's understandable that the Europeans are now in a position that they're so vulnerable to be invaded just because they're so traumatized from conflict. And that's very unfortunate. Do you see the Germans of today as responsible, still responsible for the Holocaust? No. And do they need to keep apologizing? No, I think they've done enough. I apologize. Germans of today are responsible for the Holocaust. No. They need to keep apologizing. No. Do you think that the Germans of today have to still be sorry for the Holocaust, and do they still have to apologize? It's a problem, because it's a new generation, and they are not uh, responsible for what the grandfather did. I think they have to acknowledge the fact that uh, the Holocaust happened, but the generation today had nothing to do with it, but uh, has to learn from the past that it will never happen again. What is woke? Baby, don't woke me. Don't woke me. No more. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, not sorry. All right. You just look at these two Koreas, North Korea and South Korea. Exact same people, homogeneous people, had thousands, almost 5,000 years of same history, ate the same food, same genetics, same culture. Under two different systems, one became South Korea, the land of K-pop and Samsung and innovation and freedom. And one country literally became the darkest place on earth. It be, entire country became a concentration camp. It's just because they, they somehow chose a different system. And it can happen to America if we choose a different system that is other than empowering individual liberty and freedom and free market, we can totally can become like North Korea. We recognize inequities built by past and present traumas rooted in white supremacy, colonialism, the gender binary, ableism, and all forms of oppression. I am freeing men from the restraints of an intelligence that has taken charge. That's when I, you know, started to unpack and look at what they were talking about when they were mentioning white supremacy culture. I saw one of their slides and it had these poison bottles on it. And it, it had things like being on time, being objective. And from the demands of a freedom and personal independence, which only a very few can bear. We don't have to view everything through a matrix of domination and oppression. Uh, even just saying that got me labeled as a pariah. I mean, we saw what happened to people. We, we saw that people were literally being told to leave the university if they said something offensive. From the dirty and degrading self-mortification of a chimera called conscious and morality. This is a woman who became president of perhaps the most elite university in America. And she's, she published no books. She published 11 articles in her career. And it's turned out that uh, much of them were just plagiarized, stolen from other people. So how did she even get there in the first place? She has 50 allegations of plagiarism against her. There is no such thing as truth, either in the moral. Professor Mohammed, what do you make of that? It's a compelling argument, but unfortunately, it, it misses, to me, uh, a bigger truth. There, there are two things here that I think matter. One, um, the nature of the plagiarism, uh, let's call it on a, on a three-point scale, was a one. There's no doubt that the people attacked her um, and that have been harassing her are, are coming from a place of racism and racial animus. My grandmother would not trust Claudine Gay to herd her goats. Or in the scientific sense. Dismantling racism in mathematics is an education program that tells American teachers not to push students to find the correct answers to maths problems because doing so promotes 
white supremacy. Yep, you heard that right. The California State Education Panel thinks two plus two equals four is inequitable and no longer wants to make getting the right answer the main objective of mathematics. Why do I have to be taught politics in math? Why do I have to go into a science class and talk about how racist America is in 2022? Why are they going so in on politics in school? It doesn't make any sense. And this is like in the early 2000s. Obviously today it's completely different. It's even more extreme. I am freeing men from the restraints of an intelligence that has taken charge from the dirty and degrading self-mortification of a chimera called conscious and morality and from the demands of a freedom and personal independence, which only a very few can bear. Conscience is a Jewish invention. It is a mutilation, like circumcision. There is no such thing as truth, either in the moral or in the scientific sense. Adolf Hitler. That's your testimony today, calling for the genocide of Jews is depending upon the context. That is not bullying or harassment. This is the easiest question to answer yes, Ms. McGill. So is your if testimony it, that it, you will not answer yes? If it uh, is, if the, yes speech becomes, no. if the speech becomes conduct, it can be harassment, yes. Conduct meaning committing the act of genocide? It's a strange, unholy alliance between uh, Islamists and radical leftists. Across the West, woke leftists joined Islamists in celebrating Hamas's attacks and calling for the extermination of Israel. I think it would confuse a lot of people why Islam and wokeness work together. They believe in different things like uh, LGBTQABC rights versus no rights to anyone that is a little bit out of heteronormativity. If you look at the hierarchy, like the anti-white supremacy theory and everything like that, you'd see that it serves Islam perfectly. First of all, I didn't even see a real reference to how you've, you're supposed to be a Muslim people. You believe Obama, then they're way more successful than, on average, than your typical everybody. So where are they in that table? So the Muslims are actually the most professional victimhood narrative builders. So they know how to always stay on the victim side. They're going to be at the top of the hierarchy of this woke agenda. And the only ones that can be there with them, with them are actually the transgenders. The blacks cannot because the moment black people succeed, they lose their blackness privileges in that awful mindset. So, yeah, so they become white supremacists the, the moment they are successful for, for who they are. So the only people who can technically be successful for real and have merit and still be at the top there are, as we can say, like the craziest transgenders and Muslims. And at the end of the day, right, when that world order is achieved, if you want to be at the top, you have two options, right? You have an option to convert to being a transgender, you know, convert, or you can convert to Islam. And this is how you can be on top. And what's even more beautiful, and I'm pretty sure that in the end of the day, there are going to be only one room on top of that pyramid. Let's just put the bats who is going to devour who first. Look at that. We're like, Perfect. It serves them perfectly. The struggle for world domination will be fought entirely between us, between Germans and Jews. All else is a facade, an illusion. Behind England stands Israel, and behind France, and behind the United States. Even when we have driven the Jew out of Germany, he remains our world enemy. So I saw this beautiful pyramid that is taught in woke classes about white supremacy and of course ending white supremacy is first of all fighting the Jews that represent that white supremacy. And of course one might say, wait, are the Jews white at all? It doesn't matter because white supremacy in wokeness in, and even in Nazism, to be honest, has nothing to do with the 
color of your skin, really, it almost has nothing to do with it, especially in wokeness. They are actually exactly right when they say that they want to fight the Jews to add white supremacy, because their goal is to end the values that are white supremacy values that are actually Western values. And what are the Western values? They are, first of all, Judeo-Christian values. Pinocchio's mischief has landed his maker Geppetto in prison for the night, and the talking cricket insists that Pinocchio must either attend school or work to function properly in the world. When Pinocchio refuses to listen, the cricket states, you are a puppet and what's worse is that you have a head of wood, whereupon Pinocchio throws a mallet at the cricket, which kills him. Who are the Jews? Why are we called Israel? Israel is because we fight God, we argue with God, we're argumentative people. And if the king is naked, I have to say that the king is naked. There's another part of the ideology that I think is really important to point out, which is that it judges justice not based on equality of opportunity, but based on equality of outcome. And if you look at Jewish success, let's say, in America, and you look at the inordinate number of Jews in, you know, who have won Nobel Prizes or have succeeded economically or whatever, choose, choose the category you want to choose, well, that's a little bit suspicious, right? Because any disparity of outcome has to be the result of systemic discrimination, any disparity of outcome has to be some kind of conspiracy, is what this ideology suggests, which is why, of course, it's not just Jews that have been singled out, but Asian Americans who have had an unbelievable amount of success, at least when it comes to academic life. And so an ideology that suggests that any differences in outcome is somehow suspicious will inevitably lead to a politics that is suspicious and indeed hostile to the Jews. When something comes from the academia, and then you have to use so much media to make it a popular idea, doesn't it point that there is something fishy here? Because I sure thought something was weird here. We are the auserkorene music folk of the world. So who were the Nazis? They were at least educated, for sure. They could have not done what they've done without having education. And they really didn't like Jews. It was a strong feeling that they all had in common. And the reason why is, from what I've gathered, a lot of the elite in the Nazi party actually either had a Jewish boss, knew some Jews very personally, were in love with a Jew, and that Jew broke their heart. Or something like that. It's like they all had a personal vengeance quest. I think this is what brought that group together to begin with. We have a Deutsch theater, a Deutsch film, a Deutsch press, a Deutsch schriftum, a Deutsch bildende kunst, a Deutsch music and a Deutsch rundfunk. Der früher oft gegen uns vorgebrachte Einwand, es gäbe keine Möglichkeit, die Juden aus dem Kunst- und Kulturleben zu beseitigen, weil deren zu viele seien und wir die leeren Plätze nicht neu besetzen könnten, ist glänzend widerlegt worden. Sometimes it's easier to eliminate a whole nation than prove your merit or worthiness. In Auschwitz I, they had half the Vienna Philharmonic sitting there. The, the truth of the matter is, is that American culture at this point, what is truly American, is black culture to a large degree. Flip on the television set. Look at Pulp Fiction. You know, I mean, you can choose whatever examples you want. Um, and and uh, uh, it's had a profound influence on, on this entire nation. And it has to be uh, affirmed. And this is how the academia managed to turn xenophobia into the deep-rooted hate that is required to create an event as big as the Holocaust. Obama secretly pushed Harvard to keep President Claudine Gay despite campus anti-Semitism plagiarism controversies. It all comes together now. It's important to understand that the Nazis and the fascists saw themselves as the left. 
because they were the left. And because most of the intellectuals in the academia are from the left, they didn't like the fact that the Nazis were also from the left. So they decided to manipulate the truth and claim that they were far right. They were not far right. They were just far right on the left. There's a very powerful relationship between the dark tetrad personality characteristics, including malignant narcissism, and the proclivity to hold left-wing authoritarian views. In fact, the correlation between malignant narcissism and left-wing authoritarianism is 0.6, which is so high that you could make the case, because the scales are somewhat unreliable, you could make the case that they're not distinguishable on the measurement front. I know exactly who Claudine Gay is. I know exactly who Liz Magle is. I know I've seen and worked with these people every single day for the past 20 years you will not find a hedge fund office in wall street on wall street that compares to the narcissism the ego the backstabbing the, the cutthroatness that is higher education o m g they are brutal killers am i surprised that this is how academia reacts to a very simple, straightforward, should be a capital Y-E-S. Yes, we are against the killing and genocide of an entire group of people based on their background. Why am I not surprised? Because this is how they are. Hitler was, in my view, primarily an hysteric. Already in the First World War, he had been officially diagnosed as such. More particularly, he was characterized by a subform of hysteria, Pseudologio Fantastica. In other words, he was a pathological liar. If these people do not start out directly as deceivers, they are the sort of idealists who are always in love with their own ideas and who anticipate their aims by presenting their wish fantasies partly as easily attainable and partly as having been attained, and who believe this obvious lies themselves. In order to realize their wish fantasies, no means is too bad for them, just because they believe they can thereby attain their beloved aim. They believe they are doing it for the benefit of humanity, or at least the nation or their party, and cannot, under any circumstances, see that their aim is invariably egoistic. Since this is a common failing, it is difficult for the layman to recognize such cases as psychopathic. One of the reasons that I think it's so important to go and read the source material, because if you read a quote like that, like what Hitler is saying about the Jews. Conscience is a Jewish invention. It is a mutilation, like circumcision. If you ignore like the extra um, comments, those are compliments. Really, like, <laughs> thank you. But here is something that's important to remember. Not all People were created with the same worldview or understanding of what's good and bad. We need more psychology. We need more understanding of human nature because the only real danger that exists is man himself. He is the great danger. And we are pitifully unaware of it. We know nothing of man, far too little. His psyche should be studied because we are the origin of all coming evil. For example, for many psychopaths or many people that have uh, personality disorders, weakness is bad. Is bad. So you grow up as a psychopath and you start seeing other people crying over things and you don't have those reactions and you start viewing them as inferior. Right? You're superior to them. You don't, you don't uh, have these weak little emotions that the rest of them have. And so you're superior and you end up a as a narcissist. And that's something that's important to understand. Some people, and it's so critical to learn that, not everybody thinks that being a good person is a good thing. And that's just something that must be understood. People who build those ideologies they look for power and they look at niceness and morality as weakness. 
that has to be destroyed. This is what Carl Jung had written in 1918 comparing between the Jewish and Aryan psychology. Christianity split the Germanic barbarian into an upper and lower half and enabled him by repressing the dark side to domesticate the brighter half and fit it for civilization. But the lower darker half still awaits redemption and a second spell of domestication. Until then, it will remain associated with the vestiges of the prehistoric age with a collective unconscious which is subject to a peculiar and ever-increasing activation. As the Christian view of the world loses its authority, the more menacingly will the blond beast be heard prowling about in its underground prison, ready at any moment to burst out with the devastating consequences. And if you are the kind of person that thinks that kindness is a weakness, and that the fact that Christianity through Judaism was brought to Europe and it changed the society and turned the strong Germans that were pagans and they were warriors and they were violent, <laughs> basically, into those feeble creatures who care about morality and truth and science, then, yeah, Jews would be your number one enemy. That makes sense because in your worldview, morality is bad. As a member of a race with a 3,000-year-old civilization, the Jew, like the culture Chinese, has a wider area of psychological consciousness than we. Freud and Adler have beheld very clearly the shadow that accompanies us all. The Jews have this peculiarity in common with women. Being physically weaker, they have to aim at the chinks of the armor of their adversary. And thanks to that technique, which has been forced on them through the centuries, the Jews themselves are best protected where others are most vulnerable, because again of their civilization. More than twice as ancient as ours, they are vastly more conscious than we of human weakness, the shadow side of things, and has, in this respect, much less vulnerable than we are. Thanks to their experience of an old culture, they are able, while fully conscious of their frailties, to live on friendly and even tolerant terms with them, whereas we are still too young to not have illusions about ourselves. Wait, isn't it a video about anti-Semitism? Isn't a big part of it is trying to understand who are the Jews? And this is what I want, what I want to tackle. I was thinking, I'm a Jew, right? And as we know, Jews, some of them are atheists, but they still still see themselves as Jews. Is it like hereditary, but you still can convert? It's ethnic, it's a nation, it's so many things. But there is one story we tell every year and one commandment that I think really is the key to understanding who the Jewish people are and who am, who am I as a Jew. You see, we depend largely upon our history. Uh, we are shaped through education, through the influence of the parents, which are by no means always personal. They were prejudiced or they were influenced by historical ideas or what I call dominance. And, uh, and that is uh, a most decisive factor in psychology. And we are not of today or of yesterday. בכל דור ודור חייב אדם לראות את עצמו כאילו הוא בעצמו יצא אתה משעבוד במצרים. So it says in the Bible several times and it's something that we repeat a lot. Um, a Jew has to see himself, every person has to see himself as if it was him who went, who left Egypt. As if he was he that was the slave. This is not something that is in the past. The stories that we tell ourselves, that's who we are. And what is the story a Jewish person tells themselves? Well, we left Egypt and we have to remember we were slaves. And what does it mean? That we were slaves and that means we understand that it, it was us yesterday and it might be us again tomorrow. And therefore there is inequality in front of the law. So every person has to get the same judgment in the court, no matter who they are. This is one. Two, we wandered the desert for 40 years. Why? Because just because we left Egypt doesn't mean we stopped being slaves. And when the Israelites left Egypt, they weren't people yet. And they were complaining a lot and they were trying to blame the whole world and its wife, as we say in Hebrew, 
about the difficulties of living in a desert because it's a really, really harsh environment. So how do you survive there? And because it's a harsh environment, every person has to contribute to survive. And this is a lesson that they had to learn because when you're a slave, you're getting taken care of. But as a free person, you are responsible. You have personal responsibility. So no leader in the world can turn the desert into a forest, but you can plant a tree and it's very different. You can bring water, you can dig. There are so many things that you can do as a person. So until the Israelites did not learn that they are responsible to their own fate, they weren't allowed to enter Israel. Third, third thing that is really important, there is a real resistance in our stories to kings, to the concept of someone that is on a higher level, because we were all slaves in Egypt together, right? So the person that is uh, nominated to be the king he was a slave just, just as much as I was. So what we see is that every leader in the Bible and later in, in, in our history is criticized as they're leading. And what does it teach us? The freedom of speech, the, the high value of a freedom of speech. You cannot shut <laughs> the Jewish people. They are very stubborn. They are argumentative. And there is nobody that is exempt for getting criticized. There is a teensy bit of a problem with how the Nazis rose to power, that they just say whatever was popular so they would get the power. They cared more about the power than what's right, what's wrong. They had a certain ideology that was very hateful, that was based on the fact that they're the best. But other than that, other than the, that very obvious inferiority complex that united them all, there was not much meat to it because they were anti-capitalist when it was comfortable, it, they were anti-Marxist when it was comfortable, and they were whatever was needed. People dreamt of the great change, and that's the reason why uh, such great transformations could be predicted. Somebody has been clever enough, for instance, I have predicted the Nazi rising in Germany uh, through the observation of my German patients. Yeah. They had dreams in which the whole thing was anticipated and, and with considerable detail. And I, I was already absolutely certain in, 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 in the years before Hitler, well I could, uh, could say the year, in the year 1919, I was sure that something was threatening in Germany. Something very big and very catastrophic. And I only knew it through the, through the observation of the, of, of the, of the unconscious. First, let's do a recap of what happened in Germany so that we are all on the same page. Basically, the Germans weren't fond of the Anglo-Saxon concept of democracy. They wanted a strong leader. The years of democracy were the worst years in the collective memory of the Germans. And it's the same thing with the Russians today, by the way. Anyway, let's understand the Nazis a little bit more. They gathered popularity because they had a very good hunch at sniffing trends. So whatever was needed to be said to get votes, that's what they would say. The Jew thing was only an asterisk in the election campaign of the Nazis, and it took time and effort for that asterisk to go from the sidelines to the main stage. The Nazis had to work hard to militarize and brainwash the population. If you were wondering how they had the money for it after they were forced to pay compensation after World War I, well, they didn't pay for it. America did. So how do you stay in power? How do you run a society? How do you get that fame and recognition they dreamt of when you don't have any substance. Lucky for them, they were very academically gifted, some of them, and that cookbook was already there. They didn't have to invent anything. There is a very famous pyramid scheme of rulership. They don't even have to have a substance. They can just rule the people. And that's a very, very famous pyramid scheme. That pogrom kind of anti-Semitism that we saw a lot in Russia 
was very encouraged by the Tsar because he wanted to deflect the peasants' attention from their awful living conditions. And he was like, hey, go kill the Jews and I, I'm not going to do anything. You can, you can have all their stuff. And that was enough for them, really. Like, it was like, I don't even know if they hated Jews. They were like, wait, we can loot and not get punished? Sign me up. Who can I loot? That's it. That's all they needed to know. Today, m most people need more than that. Ignoring mandatory curfews, <laughs> violently clashing with police, overturning cars, <laughs> torching buildings, and looting stores. Yeah, most. These people seem to not need that much motivation to go looting anyway. Race is not a left-wing or a right-wing value. It has become a left-wing value in, in the last 25 years uh, in the West. Or did it? The Democratic Party believes that government has an important role to play in society. It fights against economic inequality. It advocates policies that battle racial and gender discrimination. In short, woke. The Democratic Party was once the party of white supremacy, supporting slavery and the Ku Klux Klan. To understand how the party made such a huge shift, it didn't. The Democratic Party today is ignoring, forgive me if I'm wrong, but largely ignoring what is happening in the universities, which is classic, classical anti-Semitism. That's what identifies them as leftists. It's the, the, only, the only thing that is consistent across all people who label themselves as leftists is that they, they claim to be fighting for the underdog. So the people who push this race issue, is it that they really care about black people or Asian people or Jewish people? Or is it that it's just another wedge issue to try and destroy this culture and destroy this society? There are some people who are, who are, who are, who are both. Some really believe it, and I, I feel sorry for them. But there are some, some who really don't care. If, if it gets them elected, that's what matters. And this is one of the tragedies of trying to politicize race. And what's happening now is that the woke thing is pretending that it um, doesn't categorize the blacks as slaves. I tell you, if you have a problem figuring out whether you're for me or Trump, then you ain't black. This rhetoric that because I think for myself, because I am more center right, that because I date a white guy, that all these things that don't align with black culture, all of a sudden I'm not black. And there is a reason, like no matter what skin color the Jew in front of you is, they're all white supremacists, okay? And also blacks who don't fall into that victimhood narrative, they're also white supremacists. This is how unrelated to your skin color this woke movement is. If you read the data from uh, London, educational tests and so forth, you see that there, uh, immigrants from Africa uh, pass this test they have nearly 60% of the time. Blacks from the Caribbean, like 50%, so on. Native born whites in the same low income bracket pass this test 30% of the time. The foreign people come in they haven't had generations of being steeped in the welfare state vision, the vision of grievances, victimology, and resentments, the idea that there are enemies out there dedicated to keeping you down. That's the, that, that's the message that's been t pumped into the head of the, of the white lower class in Britain. And that's the, uh, the image that's been pumped into the black low-income people in the United States. And the, and the results are the same in both cases. They just try to bring black people down. That's the bottom line of it. I get it. Like the DEI, they decided to put Claudine Gay as the president of uh, Harvard. Isn't it evil? Isn't it evil to put this kind of person as the first African-American woman that is a president of uh, a late university like Harvard. I don't know, maybe, I mean, at Harvard. I didn't check if there were others in other universities, but Harvard is like the number one university in the world, so it's great prestige. Are you telling me that there aren't black women who actually have some merit in them? Because I am 100% certain that there are a lot of black women that are actually capable. So to put someone that would stain, like to have that in history, that's such a stain. That's a shame. That's a real shame. And I think you should respect yourselves more. Like I, I don't want to be like lecturing or anything, but you should respect yourself more. 
Really? This is not something you want to represent you because this is not who you are. This is just, I'm sorry, I'm going to use woke language, okay? This is just racist people who think that black people cannot succeed on their, by their own right. And that's the worst kind of racism, really. They made North Koreans into 51 different classes among the same people. We are not like America, there's a lot of diversity of race. We are the same Korean homogeneous country and they divided us into 51 different classes. And this system is so evil because if you, there's a two lovers meet each other, right? And you love this girl so much. But if your family status is higher than her, if you marry her, that means in North Korea, you don't marry up. You only go down. That's how they prevent the mix of class. The Nazis, they hated the world, right? But they didn't hate themselves per se. They didn't hate the Germans. They didn't try to destroy the German people because uh, the German people, they were, as a whole, they were just the Aryans and that's it. 1.5 maybe percent of Jews, okay? Really like a ridiculous number. But in the U.S.? There is no such thing. There is no such thing as a majority in the U.S. It is widely supposed that the Anglo-Saxon is king in America, right? Yes. Now, in what sense do you disprove this? In terms just of, mere, of sheer numbers, <laughs> that uh, Anglo-Saxons are about 15% of the population. So the notion of speaking of an Anglo-Saxon majority and then the various minorities around them uh, seems a little ludicrous. This is somebody who's trying to ruin the United States from within because the United States is built on merit. It's built on the idea that it doesn't matter where you come from. This is why there was freedom of religion from the day one. The Brits were the ones that forced the whole world to abolish slavery. This is the, the principles that the United States was, was founded upon. <laughs> they call themselves the New Israel, okay? Let's just say it like that, okay? They were the New Israel. And what's interesting with the Israelites, those who formed in Egypt, like, who received the Torah, they weren't necessarily all the Israelites. Like Tzipora, Moses' wife, she was from Midian and she was black. And there were other people. It, it was many different peoples who believed in the same ideas, right? And they had to be turned into one people. That's part of it as well. And it's okay to have diversity. It's okay. I love that the new features is melting pot to be so active that it will be not necessary to undermine every time that they are uh, the Negro and they are the white and they are the Hispanic, etc., etc., because there is no difference. All of them are created by the same God and created for the same purpose to end all good things around them and around, especially beginning by themselves and their families. All of the Christians were oppressed by, by uh, the Inquisition, the Catholics and the Protestants, and before that, the Proto-Protestants. Everybody was oppressed. Anti-Semites are a danger to everyone. The, the, the modern West was created by a rebellion against the anti-Semitic ruling elites of of the Western world. That's how the modern world was created. Now you go further, further, even further back to the Roman Empire and you find the Roman Empire committing genocide against the ancient Jews and the Roman Empire was also enslaving everybody. You see, so this is a pattern. This is a pattern, uh, anti-Semitic, and the Roman Empire was totalitarian. So, so it's perfectly consistent, perfectly consistent. And now we have uh, Islam uh, the, the forces of radical Islam uh, calling for another genocide, uh, preparing for another genocide, hell-bent on another genocide of the Jews. And what do they want for us? They also want to oppress us. They, the, all of us non-Jews, they, they consider us infidels. Uh, and uh, they, they'll start with the Jews, just like the Nazis started with the Jews. Uh, but that's not where it's going to stop. They're coming for us. So why do you have to fight the Jews when you're trying to fight white supremacy? when you're trying to fight the West, because Jews represent that in our unconsciousness. And everybody knows that because we all heard everybody from the Abrahamic religion learned about the 
Israelite story about how they left Egypt. And even if it's un subconscious, I think we all collectively understand that the Jews are a symbol to Western society because this is what they brought. They brought those principles that define them. And if you want to fight the West, you have to fight the Jews. And as long as the Jews are alive, you would have someone that criticizes you. You would have someone that if they are genuine about their, you know, identity as an Israelite or a Jew, they would fight for equality in, in front of the law. And they will never, ever be the victim because you cannot be a victim if you learn that only slaves have a, have a victim mentality. So you want to see Jews feeling sorry for themselves, for everything that they went through. Not really, because per, we, our life in Egypt was awful, but we learned in the desert that sometimes life is hard and it's tough and we all have to do our parts and we are all responsible, personal responsibility. So someone who has personal responsibility cannot be victimized. And Jews, no matter how hard their life will get, no matter how hard our life gets, we will not be victimized. We will not turn into slaves because we learned our lesson. We have that experience. We know that having victimhood mentality means that you're still a slave. That's what it means. فرضوا احترامهم على العالم بعلمهم لا بإرهابهم بعملهم لا بزعيقهم البشرية مدينة بمعصم اكتشافات وعلوم القرن التاسع عشر والقرن العشرين لعلماء اليهود خمسة عشر مليون مشرد في العالم جمعوا شملهم ووصلوا إلى حقوقهم بالعمل والعلم لم نرى يهوديا واحدا يفجر نفسه داخل مطعم ألماني لم نرى يهوديا واحد يهدم كنيسة لم نرى يهوديا واحد يحتج على ذلك بقتل الناس They're not loyal to America or the UK or Australia or Canada or any other Western country. Hundreds and thousands of Muslims along with a few blue-haired Wokistanis have turned up in the streets of Western capitals chanting death to the US, death to the UK. عندما قال نبي الإسلام أمرت أن أقاتل الناس حتى يؤمن بالله ورسوله عندما قسم المسلمون الناس إلى مسلم وغير مسلم ودعوا إلى قتال الآخرين حتى يؤمنوا بما يؤمنون هم أثاروا هذا الصراع هم بدأوا تلك الحرب I don't see much future for Americans. It's a decayed country, and they have the racial problem and the problem of social inequalities. My feelings against Americanism are feelings of hatred and deep repugnance. Everything about the behavior of American society reveals that it's half Judaized and the other half necrified. How can one expect a state like that to hold together? Hitler. They organized to smash personal freedom, equality of man, freedom of speech, freedom of religion. Organized to smash the very principles which made us the people we are. Because what was the Nazi ideology? Let's review it. Fight Christianity. Like, I remember being in classes that had nothing to do with politics or had nothing to do with spirituality, but yet the liberal professors were also eager to talk badly about Christianity and talk badly about Republicans and talk badly about right-leaning policies. Throughout history, Islam has demonstrated through words and deeds the possibilities of religious tolerance. I saw it firsthand as a child in Indonesia, where devout Christians worshiped freely in an overwhelmingly Muslim country. The government of Sudan in 1983 decided to declare jihad on infidels 
Those happen to be Christians. The government of Sudan slaughtered two millions and destroyed every single village. Seven million Southern Sudanese as refugees and most important to take the youngest one into the slavery. White good, not white are slaves. It's racist to teach black kids standard English. That perpetuates white supremacy. Yes, that's the idea, right? It gives a black kid who grew up without hearing that a disadvantage. All the more reason for that black kid to learn it. And throughout history, Islam has demonstrated through words and deeds the possibilities of racial equality. I was abducted by an Arab man and given away to his relative as a gift. And Obama, who obviously has more of a connection to Africa than any previous president, how has he performed on this issue? You know, uh, I know President Obama, and they are disappointed of the president, of lack of commitment, of lack of leadership. The position was not very clear. He is not even our age. So that's that it is an American baby. It is, it is the United States government that is created in that nation. We have to put it very clear. Why Americans have to walk away from them? White are slaves. White supremacy has to be dismantled. Who were the slaves, like the, the original slaves? They were the Slavs, and you cannot get more white than a Slav, okay? They were more white than the Germans. And still, in Hitler's mind, they were slaves. And there is a historic reason for that. To understand how the Slavic ethnonym became the foundation for almost every Western language's word for slave, we must talk about the history of the medieval Slavic slave trade. But I don't think, like, um, the woke the woke supremacy movement is like sophisticated enough to like distinguish between two European, so they just clump. I was asked to then write a paper about how I was privileged being white. Can you imagine like being a Slav and like never like never being a colonizer, suffering all your life, all your ancestors were like poor and uh, got kidnapped every on, uh, on left and right to be sold as slaves and then you're like turned into a slave or no. And I was really shocked to come to understand the history of Italians in America and they weren't seen as white. The hierarchy that the National Socialist Movement built was random, okay? They, they decided who's white on, based on what's comfortable. Women are baby-making machines. I reject the view of some in the West that a woman who chooses to cover her hair is somehow less equal. We want to be honest that we are working with the Muslim Muslims on to be on the right way and the right way. And I have the Murshid Al-Aam to the Muslim Muslims and I have to ask for what to ask. What to ask? أول حاجة قال لي يجب أن تقيم الحجاب في مصر. دارش دارا بس كلا ما ما يجي خامش من هول بكورس ولا زيدا. كن إم يأخذ أريد. أزادي. بيادهم كإسلام. 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 أز and a poll taken two years ago found that the majority of British Muslims wanted being gay to be made illegal now. This is Hamtramck, Michigan, a predominantly Muslim town that made it illegal to hang the gay flag up in public space. I'm not teaching hate against Muslims. Muslims should not be teaching hate against gay people. They had so young this, people yeah. at the polls screaming kill the fact during the voting. Religion and politics have to be totally separate. The Constitution says we're allowed to have religious beliefs. And in our religion, it says a woman wears, marries a woman or a guy marries a guy, like strictly forbidding. This city. the rest of us alone. I don't care either. Political opponents, bad. Why is your government supporting Islamo nationalism? What? What are you doing? You're under arrest for assault. Why are you supposed to be? You're under arrest for assault. In Russia last year, 400 people were arrested for things that they said on social media. How many people do you think were arrested in Britain for things they said on social media last year? 
Go on. Take a guess. I have no idea. 3,300. Really? And then two days before my speech, the head of diversity calls me. The head of diversity? Yeah. At the FBI? Yeah. She says, like, we have to answer your speech because of your political opinions. In my American interview, citizenship interview, my interview asking me this exact question. Have you ever persecuted anybody for their political opinion? You know, if you said yes, you cannot become American. But you can become FBI. They've been targeting conservatives for the past, ar arguably since the Obama administration, when it was discovered that he was using the IRS to go after conservatives. And I consider it part of my responsibility as President of the United States to fight against negative stereotypes of Islam wherever they appear. <laughs> لكي نجيب على سؤال أساسي إذا قلنا بأن ما تفعله داعش لا على قلوب الإسلام فكيف نفسر اعتمادها نصوص إذا كانت داعش قد أخطأت أو أنصار الشريعة أو طالبان طيب ما هو الفهم الصحيح لهذه النصوص أعتقد بأن, بأن ما يهرب منه الفقهاء هو أن يقول بأن هذه النصوص لها سياقات سابقة لم تعد موجودة اليوم. Jews are the worst of creatures, comparable to apes and pigs. Must kill every last one of them. Find them wherever they are, no matter how many rocks or trees you have to turn. قال الله تعالى عن اليهود كل الحروب والفتن. التي تعصف بالبشرية جميعا هي من أخطيط اليهود. There have been a lot of attempts by the Islamists to kind of um, you know get the sympathy of <laughs> of Christians in order to demonize Jews together, and also a big attempt from uh, neo Nazis, uh, which you can see a lot, to um, kind of try to appeal to Muslims and be like, hey, we actually have a lot in common, you know, but those those evil ones they don't have anything with us in common and stuff like that. And that is just. I love how the big ego and the self centeredness of the West made them believe that they invented anti-Semitism. Ha ha, They're, they have nothing on Muslims, man. <laughs> Actually, like, Muslims kill everybody. And once again, those forces join hands together in the one beautiful goal of making the hadith that says that every Jew will hide behind a stone and a tree come true. All oh, Muslim, there is a Jew behind me. Come and kill it. On November 11th, 1914, the highest religious authority of the Ottoman Caliphate, Sheikh al-Islam Urguplu Hayli, called for a worldwide jihad against Russia, Britain, and France. And just like that, World War I became a holy war. This sparked hope into the hearts of the German Reich. In his famous paper of October 1914, Max von Oppenheim, a German diplomat and Orientalist, described Islam as one of Germany's most important weapons against the West. How much were the Nazis influenced by Islam? A lot. A lot. Here's a quote by Mufti Amin al Husseini. Husseini was the biggest Palestinian movement leader ever bigger than Arafat, and there is a good reason why people don't like talking about him. He was great friends with Hitler, and when Hitler was debating the Jewish question, the Mufti told him to burn them, burn them. Hitler originally didn't think to necessarily kill all the Jews, but the Mufti was clear about it. You gotta burn them all. Here is the condition the Mufti set to Hitler so that the Arab world will cooperate with him. Our fundamental condition for cooperation with Germany was a free hand to eradicate every last Jew from Palestine and the Arab world. I asked Hitler for an explicit undertaking to allow us to solve the Jewish problem in a manner befitting our national and racial aspirations and according to the scientific methods innovated by Germany in the hands of its Jews. The answer I got, the Jews are yours didn't want to uh, exterminate the Jews at the time, he wanted to expel the Jews. And Khaj Amin al-Husseini went to Hitler and said, if you expel them, they'll all come here. So what should I do with them? He asked. He said, burn them.
Here is another fun fact that I found. One of the intellectuals that inspired the Protocols of Zion actually converted to Islam at some point. We do not know whether Hitler is gonna found a new Islam. He is already on the way. He is like Muhammad. The emotion in Germany is Islamic, warlike and Islamic. They are all drunk with a wild god. The biggest concentration of Jews outside of Israel live in the US. And even though there are still Jews in Europe, and they're affected by the anti-Semitism in Europe. With everything that's going, on, that's going on there, I'm pretty sure it's going to go down to zero. Here, I was thinking, wait, I've seen that pattern before. Jews are native to the Middle East. And there is a clear description of genocide of the Jews in one scripture in particular, the Quran. Alexandria and Baghdad and Jerusalem and Medina was a Jewish city. Egypt used to have 75,000 Jews. Where are your Jews? Syria, you had tens of thousands of Jews. Where are your Jews? Iraq, you had over 135,000 Jews. Where are your Jews? And there was a Jewish kingdom in Yemen. So where did that all go? After filming that, I was like, why am I putting those numbers out of my eyes? Let me just check the real numbers. I just thought that there were more European Jews than Middle Eastern Jews, and I had some prior knowledge of events that happened, but the real numbers, when I looked at them, I was shocked. So here's the data. In the 11th century, only 3% of Jews were Ashkenazi Jews. More broadly, only a small minority of the Jews were living in Christian countries. Most lived under Islam, which is Middle East area, North Africa, and so on. In the middle of the 17th century, 40% of Jews were Ashkenazi Jews. By the end of 18th century, it was 60% of Jews that were Ashkenazi Jews living under Christianity. And in 1920, 92% of Jews worldwide were Ashkenazi Jews. From 97%, they went down to 8%. You see, I don't think that Jews really assimilated or converted in those countries because Jews are very stubborn. It's not something they would do. And then I just imagined like this Muhammad Hijab's guy voice in my head going like, oh, they just saw the beauty of Islam and converted. No, they didn't. Look at the numbers. Look at that data. Is it a genocide or is it assimilation? 11th century Middle East, 20 million people. 16th century Middle East? 18 million people. In Europe that also suffered from the Black Death and lots of wars, it went from 40 million to 78 million. Africa went from 32 million to 47 million. And my guess is that if you look at Northern Africa separately, the numbers will be more similar to the Middle East than they are. Because the data I looked at consider the Middle East area, but without Africa. Okay, the Middle East lost 2 million people in that period of time. That's a huge number to lose in 500 years. That means there is a continuous butchering. And when I looked it up and read about it, I realized how much butchering happened in Persia, how much butchering happened in India when the Islam tried to Islamize India. The death toll was incredible. And guess what? They burned books. They burned prayer places. They burned people. Doesn't it sound familiar? And then after that, the, the Muslims, just like the Nazis tried to do, claim that everything that was invented and created and achieved in the world is somehow under the Muslim achievement. Even though a lot of the scientists, they claim that were Muslim and they, they didn't like Islam at all. They were persecuted by Islam and the Muslims didn't even recognize those scientists. Uh, the Western the Western, the, the European Christians recognize the work of those scientists, not the Muslims that take credit for it. 1500 to 1820, the population in the Middle East only grew in 1.4 times. Europe, three times. And if you think they had better medicine or anything like that, maybe. But also did East Asia, it grew in three times. And Africa, 1.6. And South Asia, two times more. It's crazy, like, the further you go from Islam, the more growth you have of population. What did you do, Muslims? And what did I even expect? 
Like, you deny what happened on October 7th. You, didn't, you deny the Armenian genocide. You deny the Holocaust. Everything that happens in your territory is denied somehow and ignored. And people in Yemen are starving and it's ignored. Two million of Yemen's children are malnourished and 1.7 million have been forced to flee their homes. In Pakistan, there is a huge ethnic cleaning and chasing of minorities and it's ignored. The government has set a November 1st deadline for them to leave or be expelled. Look at what is happening in Nigeria. And I promise you that the diseases you brought from Saudi Arabia, they're not the reason. There isn't a vast ocean between Saudi Arabia and the rest of the Middle East. Just like the Arab slave trade that, that is only now brought to the public's attention, there is so much more to uncover in that Islamic skeleton closet. So it happened in the Middle East, it happened in Europe, and now is it going to happen in the United States? But the USA... It's the land of the free. Xenophobia hurts the very foundation United States is built on. So when we see the, that mob and that influence in the academy in the United States that is built on diversity as a melting pot, there is a really good chance that those are foreign powers trying to bring the United States down. If there is some dispute about the Muslim takeover of the United States in the foreseeable future, there is full agreement that the Muslims in Miami and elsewhere are a hard-driving, tightly-knit, highly disciplined group trying to take as many people as possible into their fold and billfold. And that tactic of pretending that they're nice and pluralistic and they, that they believe in liberalism and progressiveness is a, a tactic that Islam used a million times throughout history to penetrate a community and then ruin it from inside. Once they get to a critical number, that's how they expanded. Other times they just slaughtered. Throw the Jew down the well. So if I want not this, I'm selling my country for free. I could be rich. Aren't we entitled to worry about where all this money is coming from, whether it is in fact implement the, whether it's in fact influencing their implementation of policy and their acts in government before they get this money? They're already wondering what they're going to get in this magical world of uh, of, of post of post office statesmanship, where they all become rich. Rising emboldenment of anti-Semitism. Silence is complicity. Unless it comes with a bribe, of course. This is according to Toronto Sun, saying protesters are being paid to take part in the so-called pro-Palestinian demonstrations. About $20,000. Qatar is a major US ally. The largest US base in the Middle East is in Qatar. If everybody knows that Qatar is playing a double game, why is nobody doing anything about it? You see, Qatar today cannot be decoupled from the West, despite supporting ISIS, despite supporting Hamas, despite supporting Iran. The Qatari money has taken over the West over the past 20 years. The Institute for the Global Study of Anti-Semitism found that from 2015 to 2020, institutions that accepted unreported money from Middle Eastern donors had an, on average, 300 more anti-Semitic incidents than those institu institutions that did not. From 2014 through 2019, Penn received a total of almost $300 million in Section 117 funding. Are you aware of the amount that was given by Qatar? Were any of these donations conditioned on the inclusion of a pro-Palestinian curriculum or pro-Palestinians events, American Muslims for Palestine, or AMP. AMP was founded in 2006 and has become one of the leading groups providing anti-Zionist training and education to students and anti-Israel activists. AMP's goal is the destruction of the state of Israel. It aims to achieve this by influencing American society in four key areas university campus activism, lobbying Congress, influencing left-wing intersectional politics, and turning American Jews against Israel. Since the establishment of Israel, 
Israel saved so many Jews around the world. It airlifted Jews from Yemen. It airlifted Jews from Iraq. It airlifted Jews from, uh, from Ethiopia. It airlifted Jews from Morocco and from Egypt. So every time, and throughout the history, and Iran, of course, every time Jews got in trouble, no matter how poor the country was and how starving, it didn't matter because the goal was to save the Jews. And that means all Jews, no matter where they're from. After the establishment of Israel, when it was the, well, there was a real danger for the annihilation of the Iraqi Jews, they, were, they got airlifted away. The Yemeni Jews, by the way, all the abuse in Yemen and the, the abuse in Yemen was terrible. They weren't allowed to wear shoes. Like the abuse that the Jews went through in the Islamic world is unbelievable and really undeniable. And, and yeah, in the Morocco, they lived in ghettos everywhere. They lived in ghettos. They were poor and starving. And yet, and the Ethiopian Jews, like the way they managed to keep their faith and what they did to get to Israel, their story is incredible. And I admire them. I actually admire every part of the Jewish people because we all went through a lot. So we were, all, we were all slaves, we were all wandering the desert, and we are all gathered back to have our own government. And we criticize it all day, all night, all day. It's a good bit excessive, it's like, it's counterproductive at this point, but okay. When you are part of the neo-Nazi movement, and you stand up in the morning when you drink your first tea, and you hate, you hate all day. Hate is just part of your life every every second. So here's what I've learned. Teach hate once, that's organic. Teach hate twice, that's on purpose. The Arab citizens of Israel receive equal rights. They get welfare, they get education, they get health care, anything that a Jewish citizen would get. My Muslim teacher used to teach us everything about the Jews who stole the land, he would be teaching us that we would never be able to become anything in this country because this is the Jewish country and the Jewish people would not allow you to become an engineer, they would not allow you to become doctor, you cannot be anything. And we will have to resist, we would have to fight, we would have to do everything that we can to get the land back. I remember leaving these classes feeling like I don't have a future, but that really contradicted my experience with the Jewish people that I met. Because they were loving, they were kind, I was their friend, I would go to their houses. They didn't mind that I was Arab, they didn't see me as an Arab. They see me just as their friend. It didn't land very well with me. I was with my girlfriend, she was staring, and I was asking her, like, what are you thinking about? And she said, like, you know, I really wish one day to become a suicide bomber. That moment really broke me to pieces. The woke was actually created by the anti-Semites. The uh, Austrian Chancellor, Bruno Kreisky, was actually an anti-Semite. And so he invited uh, Arafat over f for a big conference. The, the German Chancellor also showed up. And they had this big thing where they, they declared that the, the, the PLO was fighting for leftist goal. The push from these leaders of the international left was so strong. Uh, there was so much media support for what they were doing and academic support in the universities for what they were doing that people ended up convinced the Palestinians were fighting an anti-colonial fight. So this is why that random German leftist teacher that I've met a long time ago told me that Hitler was right and indirectly that I actually deserve to die because of what we are doing to the Palestinians. That's where she got her ideas from. By the way, I was 12. I've been told that many times after weird shit, like people are weird, but now I know where some of it comes from. A lot of it comes from, I guess. Both the White House and the Canadian government have come up with a very bold and aggressive strategy to eradicate the genocidal Jew hatred that we're seeing. They're both launching aggressive anti-Islamophobia campaigns to combat Jew hatred. Members of the Muslim Students Association, 
sitting right in the rows there. And throughout my hour talk, I kept asking them, will you condemn Hezbollah and Hamas? And none of them would. And then when the question period came, the president of the Muslim Students Association was the first person to ask questions. And I said, you know, before you start, will you condemn Hezbollah? And he said, well, that question is too complicated for a yes, no answer. So I said, OK, I'll put it to you this way. I'm a Jew. The head of Hezbollah has said that he hopes that we will gather in Israel so he doesn't have to hunt us down globally. For it or against it? For it. Thank you. So let's say that's actually what's happening. How this no way it will happen kind of scenario will go? The director of the FBI recently stated that Jews make up 2.4% of the US population, and yet they are the victims of 60% of the hate crimes. And so it makes perfect sense when you face such a reality that the monster that you want to tackle is Islamophobia. Shake off responsibility from the Jews in your country, that's step one. Step two. Likewise, many Israelis recognize the need for a Palestinian state. Divert the attention towards Israel. That just happened to be, coincidentally, the homeland of the Jews. Threatening Israel with destruction or repeating vile stereotypes about Jews is deeply wrong. Oh, thank you. And only serves to evoke in the minds of Israelis this most painful of memories while preventing the peace that the people of this region deserve. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Everything we do is based on trauma and not logic. Gee, I almost thought I'm a human for one second and that I deserve empathy. On the other hand, it is also undeniable that the Palestinian people, Muslims and Christians, has suffered in pursuit of a homeland. For more than 60 years, they've endured the pain of dislocation. Many wait in refugee camps in the West Bank, Gaza, and neighboring lands for a life of peace and security that they have never been able to leave. حضرتك تعرف ان كان في يهود في مصر قبل كده؟ اكيد طبعا ولسه موجودين برضه. اعداء الاسلام في كل حاجه دين ودنيا. اما اليهود دول ملعونين يعني مش مش, مش كلامي يعني. كلامي مش هيعجبك. يعني بالنسبه لليهود ملاعين وعليهم لعنه الله. والله هي ديانه اليهود ناس زيهم زي المسلمين زي المسيحيين. المتعاملين كانوا هنا معانا في مصر وكانوا قاعدين معانا وكل حاجه. ما كانش في اي مشاكل فيه. كويسه لا اله الا الله. برضه يهوديه شوف يبقى مش كويس. delegation of Egyptian refugee immigrants expelled by Nasser because they are Jews. For them, this year's festival of Passover took on a special meaning. The refugees are coming in at such a rate that some are given temporary shelter in the Mabarak, the transit camps. They endure the daily humiliations, large and small, that come with occupation. <laughs> الموضوع هذا اجل حرقوهم جيبوا هتلر مم. مره ثانيه وجيبوا افران الحين في افران حديثه تاسرع تحرق وفكونا ذا كذي so let there be no doubt the situation for the palestinian people is intolerable and america will not turn our backs on the legitimate palestinian aspiration for dignity opportunity and a state of their own we got jews in my country in tripoli بكيوت دم برو they put Thank you. Listen, you need to be wiped. 
عام 39 يعني عقد اول مؤتمر للسلام في العالم هذا المؤتمر كان يعني يتبنى القضيه الفلسطينيه وقتها لم يكن لليهود الذين يعيشون في فلسطين وهم كانوا اعداد بسيطه من يهود عرب كانوا يعيشوا في فلسطين الا مطالب بسيطه وهو ان يكون لهم تمثيل في البرلمان للدوله الفلسطينيه القادمه رفضت هذه الفكره ثم بعد اقل من عشر سنوات اعلن عن التقسيم ايضا ذلك التقسيم كان على حدود بسيطه لدوله اسرائيليه صغيره ورفض هذا التقسيم للاسف من الدول العظمى العربيه في ذلك الوقت كانت العراق وسوريا ومصر وطلبوا من السكان الاصليين الهجره لانهم سيقومون بحرب ل سحق اليهود والاسرائيليين في دولتهم المنشاه ورميهم في البحر وكان موقف الملك عبد العزيز رحمه الله رافضا كان الملك عبد العزيز يقول لهم لا تنزعوا الناس من بلادهم الا انهم رفضوه وطلبوا من السكان الفلسطينيين الهجره وحصلت الهجره التي بسببها اليوم يوجد هناك نازحون في العالم العربي. Who is helping the Christians now in Pakistan? Who is helping the Christians now in Nigeria? Nobody is helping nobody. Nobody cares. If Christian countries cannot help Christian people, why would I expect a non-Jewish state to help Jewish people? In Palestine. We are persuaded that the ruinous reign of murder, ambush, arson, and poisonous incitement must be dealt with more vigorously by the British government. If you try to hide something, if you try to ignore a certain problem, it doesn't go away. <laughs> The Nazis did offer the world to just take the Jews from Germany because they are not interested in having the Jews, but they weren't interested in killing them until later. A frightened Britain under Neville Chamberlain restricted Jewish immigration to Israel in exchange for Arab support and Arab oil. Jews from Arab countries could no longer escape to Israel. The borders were sealed. In Iraq, the Arabs had no more need for subtleties. A pro-Nazi government was formed. Nazi swastikas were seen all over the streets, hinting that the time had come to eliminate the Jews. In June 1941, the Jewish quarter of Baghdad was the scene of a massacre. Hundreds of Jews were killed, thousands injured. I want to give a little bit of credit to the Brits, because the Brits did uh, stop a lot of butchering when they conquered the Middle East. And I think they kind of understood that when they give areas to leaders in the Middle East, part of it is to try to give it to those leaders who would uh, suppress some tendencies inside the Arab world. The Brits, just like they protected the Jews in Israel, they protected the Assyrians in Iraq, for example, and there were also the Copts in Egypt. The Jewish people at once began to celebrate the United Nations decision. Two days later, this was the typical scene. Arabs advancing on the center of Jerusalem at the beginning of a three-day strike and an orgy of wrecking, looting, and bloodshed. Two Remembrance Days held annually with a week to separate, so we'll have no doubt what's the cost with a Jewish state and what's the cost without. A long Jewish exile had ended, but at five o'clock in the morning, Tel Aviv was bombed by Egyptian aircraft. Israel's defenders had no illusions about the perils that they would face. Prior to Israel's independence war, this is what the Arab leader Abed Rahman Azam had declared. This will be a war of extermination and mountainous massacre, which will be spoken of like the Tartar massacre or the Crusader Wars. Israel, less than one day old, was being attacked not by untrained volunteers, but by the armies of six sovereign Arab states, well trained and lavishly equipped with British and French weaponry. The combined Arab armies had 35,000 men with modern armor and artillery. The Jewish army, men, women and high school students who face the Arab onslaught are mainly civilians, poorly equipped, barely trained, using faith and determination against overwhelming odds. Arabs looted the Jewish quarter, destroying dozens of synagogues in their wild rampage. Rifles and light machine guns began to arrive from Czechoslovakia. April was Ben-Gurion's finest hour. He ordered the Haganah to 
to abandon mere defense and to smash through to beleaguered Jerusalem. From Israel's declaration of independence, we appeal in the very midst of an onslaught lodged against us now for months to the Arab inhabitants of the state of Israel to preserve peace and participate in the upbuilding of the state on the basis of full and equal citizenship and due representation in all its provisional and permanent institutions. We extend our hand to all neighboring states and their people in offer of peace and good neighborliness and appeal to them to establish bonds of cooperation and mutual help with the sovereign Jewish people settled in its own land. The State of Israel is prepared to do its share in a common effort for advancement of the entire Middle East. Most of Haifa's 70,000 Arabs, alarmed by the intensification of hostilities, fled to neighboring Lebanon. Admit I was dead wrong. I said that Moshe Carmel, the mayor of Haifa, asked the Arabs of Haifa to stay and not flee. And Lonobox was right to correct me here. It was not Moshe Carmel. Shabtai Levi was the mayor. He's the one that asked the local Arabs to stay. We gathered in Jerusalem at the Hebron Gate. We checked who was missing and who had survived. Then the Palestinian leaders arrived, including Dr. Khalidi. I asked Dr. Khalidi how we should cover the story. He said, we must make the most of this. So he wrote a press release stating that at Dir Yassin, children were murdered, pregnant women were raped, all sorts of atrocities. Arab radio stations passed on the false reports, ignoring the protests of the witnesses. We said there was no rape. He said we have to say this, so the Arab armies will come to liberate Palestine from the Jews. This was our biggest mistake. We did not realize how our people would react. As soon as they heard that women had been raped at Dir Yassin, Palestinians fled in terror. They ran away from all our villages. During the summer of 1948, the United Nations mediator, Count Volker Bernadotte of Sweden, had been formulating a design for what he called a permanent settlement. In his first plan, he proposed to limit Jewish immigration, to award Jerusalem and the Negev to the Arab state, and to make Haifa a free port. It was like a surgeon who runs away with his patient's vital organs under the pretense of curing him. Dr. Sam Weitzman had been trying to get in all along, and I wouldn't let him in. And I told him that I would see the doctor but he'd have to bring him in the side door. I didn't want any propaganda. I said, all right, you two Jews have put it over on me, and I'm glad you have. The speech that Ambassador Austin made at the UN came as a great surprise to President Truman. He was against the Jewish program almost entirely, and I called him up at the United Nations and told him exactly what I wanted and, I, and uh, explained the whole situation to him. After he knew what all the facts were, that was the right thing to do. He said, well, Mr. President, if you want it, I'll do everything I can to put it over. The United States thought that all the Jews in Israel are going to get butchered at some point, and they really didn't think, think it's worth the time to even invest in the area. So Israel was under an arms embargo. In March 1948, prominent military strategists, including Field Marshal Montgomery, Secretary of State George Marshall, and Secretary of Defense Forrestal, were saying that the Jews would not be able to survive the imminent assault by the Arab regular armies. But then, when 1967 happened, the United States was in a sort of a conundrum. They realized they cannot continue ignoring the existence of Israel. Israel offered to return the Sinai Peninsula to Egypt and the Golan Heights to Syria on June 19, 1967. In exchange, Israel wanted peace agreements. The immediate answer was no. So even if the administration cared more about oil than humans and 
really used Israel as a destruction tool. It was still extremely ex important to them to show that they are great allies of Israel because of the people in the United States that wanted that. Uh, that uh, Israel uh, must exist and has a right to exist and is one of the great outposts of democracy in the world. My Jewish brothers and sisters said to me amid anti-Semitism anywhere, we don't need your support. We have enough Jewish power to deal with this problem ourselves. I would still take a stand against anti-Semitism because it's wrong, it's unjust, and it's evil. If my Catholic brothers and sisters said to me, amid bigotry toward Catholics, we don't need your support in this because we have enough Catholic power to deal with it, I would still take a stand against bigotry toward Catholics because it is wrong, it is evil, and it is unjust. Just. This is going to crack you up. So it's Martin Luther King Day. The FBI put out this tweet. This MLK Day, the FBI honours one of the most prominent leaders of the civil rights movement and reaffirms its commitment to his legacy of fairness and equal justice for all, which then got slapped a community note, which is kind of a correction by the team at X, saying the FBI engaged in surveillance of King, <laughs> attempted to discredit him and used manipulation tactics to influence him to stop organising. <laughs> King's family believed the FBI was responsible for his death. If they, until now, they had pressure from the bottom to support Israel, now the pressure is to go against Israel from the youngsters. And for the first time in history, maybe the people of the United States and the administration of the United States are really aligned in, the, in that feeling. In 1964, the KGB decides to form the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, based on the same model they did in Bolivia and in Colombia. And the way they did it was quite simple. They got a guy from Egypt, his name was Yasser Arafat. They faked his credentials, created the whole idea of Palestinian organizations and Palestinian people, etc., etc. And they went ahead with it to destabilize the Israelis. And by that, to cause some damage and to slow down the Americans in the Middle East. So this was an anti-US play by the KGB. And the crazy part is, in their wildest dreams, I don't think there's any KGB operative that could have guessed that this is what the PLO is going to lead to 50 years later. If you care about the people, care about the Palestinians, let them be able to work. Let them live. Let, 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 them, let them be in peace. And don't force them under a, the, the authorities that are always corrupt. Is the issue of self-determination the core of the conflict in the Middle East? The statement was very simple. Our objective? remains the destruction of the Zionist state of Israel. So let's keep in mind that what we're talking about here is not the attempt to build a state, but to destroy one. They, Israel backed them, like, why not let us just be? And the United States, no, we have to have a Palestinian state. And that was a pressure they got from the Arab states. And they knew that the Palestinian state, it was only a cover up to try to destroy Israel. But they played along with it because they wanted to keep the Middle Eastern conflict contained in the Middle East. I'm very sure that they're doing it because people are normally jealous of the rise of another, let us say, a new sheriff in town. This is human tendency. If we think that only China is upset with India's rise and America is not, we are sadly mistaken. And in fact, I think uh, America is more disconcerted with India's rise than China is. Nobody wants peace more than Israel. But the stumbling block to the road for peace is this demand for a PLO state, which will mean more war, which will mean more violence in the Middle East. And I think, I sincerely believe, if this demand is abandoned, we can have real and genuine peace. Supporting a Palestinian state is supporting war. What America wants is Pakistan, a malleable, a ductile state that has no backbone, throw dollars and they will dance to your tunes. So, of course, instead of saying, hey, we were wrong, we should really support Israel because that's our first defense line. No, they doubled down on the shit. This so-called Palestinian cause, you know, has been used for decades by dictators in the region, by the Islamists, for several, for several reasons. Dictators used this Palestinian cause to distract people from their internal 
problems, the economic and political issues. On the other side, Islamists use this to recruit supporters. And that is a really, really weird situation. So what do you do now, Biden? What do you do now? The anti-Semitism in the United States is so problematic, it can bring something similar to Nazism to the United States. Organized for the purpose of destroying us, marched under our very noses. And maybe you don't care, I guess. Of course you don't care. You don't care about the Jews in the United States. But it's more than that. The problem is that it's not going to stop with the Jews, and everybody knows that. It's a problem when that thing, when you try to demonize Israel, this all those years, it's going to blow up in your face because you brought Nazism to the United States. I mean, Nazism was very popular to, in the United States to begin with, but now you've re-brought it. Congratulations, you played yourself. We do not know whether Hitler is going to found a new Islam. He is already on the way. He is like Muhammad. The emotion in Germany is Islamic, warlike and Islamic. They are all drunk with a wild god. We have sought no shooting war with Hitler. We do not seek it now. But neither do we want peace so much that we are willing to pay for it by permitting him to attack our naval and merchant ships while they are on legitimate business. When you see a rattlesnake poised to strike, you do not wait until he has struck before you crush him. I understand what happens when people turn a blind eye to evil thinking, it's not going to happen to me, it's all the way over there, let them all kill each other. Well, over there is no longer contained over there, it's over here, and we must protect America. I started thinking, how long did the world, the United States, know about the dangers of the Islamic world? that their ideology is very similar to that of the Nazis in uh, many ways, except the praying thing and the Ramadan thing. The, the Nazis did not have that. But the, other than that, it's, I'm sorry, it's very similar. Islam, I guess, would be okay if it's just keeping halal and praying five times a day and having the Ramadan. Okay, fine. Those Muslims who only do those things, Fine. While disloyal troops were plotting the coup which resulted in murder and aroused new fears in the West. For this was the tide of Arab nationalism in flood. There was a real threat from the Islamic world of it bubbling all those emotions, all those tendencies that need to conquer and enslave and cover women. All those things that, that do bubble up and start spilling towards Europe or even worse, the United States. So they had to suppress that and they really did redirect the attentions towards Israel. We who seek no booty or territorial gain, but ready to respond to the call of smaller nations threatened with violence which cannot await deliberations at the conference table. This is outlined to the Washington press, the rush of events which saw Iraq shattered by revolt, Jordan threatened with similar violence, and an urgent plea from the president of Lebanon to the United States president for a show of U.S. support, enabling Lebanon to survive hostile forces which had been set loose there. Eisenhower, when he talked about Arab nationalism and the Islamic world, he referenced those tendencies and he implied that they already experienced the same thing and it was very clearly a reference to the Nazis. So they did know, and of course, the big boom was when uh, two airplanes have crashed into the World Trade Center in an apparent terrorist attack on our country. In 9-11, when the United States was attacked, that the government realized it cannot ignore the Islamic world anymore. And one of the deepest commitments of America is tolerance. Our nation is waging a war on a radical network of terrorists, not on a religion and not on a civilization. But now Islam actually infiltrated the United States and starting to weaken it from the inside. The Western governments have decided in recent years to do, which is to, is to lie about the nature of that religion and hope that the general public don't read. The Holy Quran teaches that whoever kills an innocent is as it is as if 
He has killed all mankind. This quote is really misleading. The first thing I notice here is the changing of words in order to make the verse more dramatic and to gain more sympathy from non-Muslims. The actual Quran verse says nothing about innocent people or innocent person. The actual text only reads, whoever kills a soul. The actual text goes like this. In Islam, there is like a list of the cases that it's not relevant. You are kind of obligated to kill people, certain people in Islam. And Islam has its own definition of what is and is not an innocent human. Indeed, the penalty for those who wage war against Allah and his messenger and strive upon earth to cause corruption is none but that they be killed or crucified or that their hands and feet be cut off from opposite sides or that they be exiled from the land. That is for them a disgrace in the world and for them in the hereafter is a great punishment. Well, that's only part of the verse. The actual verse goes like this. Because of that, we decreed upon the children of Israel that whoever kills a soul... In the Mishnah, it's written in uh, Masachet Sanadrin, uh, chapter Daled, the uh, fourth chapter, Mishnah Hey, Mishnah 5, it says, Lefekach nivra adam yechidi ba'olam, lelamed shekol ha-mabed nefesh achat, ma'alim alav, kilu ibed olam male, vekol ha-mekayem nefesh achat, ma'alim alav, kilu kiem olam umlo. If you save a soul, it's if you save the whole world. And the Holy Quran also says, whoever, whoever saves a person, it is as if he has saved all mankind. It says that Allah told the Israelites that killing one person was like killing all mankind. And of course, it's not the Muslims that believe that if you save a soul is if you save the whole world. It's the Jews that believe that. The Jews. And it was told to Israel and written to Israel, and it was not God who said that, but the rabbis of Israel that teach that the Cain and Hevel story and the creation of man as one person is there to teach us that killing a man as if it is the same as killing a whole world, because out of one person, a whole world can be created. As the Holy Quran tells us, be conscious of God and speak always the truth. So originally, I just, I didn't really, like, I wanted to stay away from, like, going, like, to private people. But there is something, I just, I couldn't resist, okay? I couldn't, like, hold myself. Um, anyway, so about Obama, right? I don't get it. Like, why does he represent, like, the African-American population in the United States? He was never a slave. His dad came from Kenya on a scholarship or something and left like his wife and two little kids and then he got like a random white woman pregnant and even though like it says that his um mom's family resisted their marriage and everything because i don't know he was black and she was white maybe they resisted it because he was like an asshole he left a woman with like pregnant to pursue his career and found another one like, ugh, it sounds awful, really. Anyway, he was not a slave. Maybe his dad, had, like, traded with slaves in their past, right? Who knows? Who knows? It was not like... Just because he's tanned, just because he has darker skin, doesn't mean he went through the same story. So he's just a privileged person that happened to be a little bit darker. So I don't know why he represents black Americans. That's it, I'm saying that. That's it, all right? is definitely a supremacist, that's for sure, though. Yeah, you know, that, that's the brilliance of intellectuals, that they, 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 they can use words in such a valuable way that they can... They, I mean, the, uh, Obama has an absolute talent for saying things that make no sense, but not only sound plausible, but inspiring. Before President Obama departed for Israel earlier this year, he took time to consult with Mohammed Majid. Majid has reportedly become a trusted administration advisor on issues ranging from immigration to counterterrorism policy. White House officials have praised Majid's organization, the Islamic Society of North America, or ISNA, as a pillar of the American Muslim community. But according to one analyst, ISNA's agenda is anything but mainstream. We also know from the Muslim Brotherhood's own documents that this is a Muslim Brotherhood front where they state it explicitly in one of their 1991 secret memos. 
Ryan Morrow works for the Clarion Project, an organization dedicated to exposing radical Islam. He told CBN News that internal Muslim Brotherhood documents captured by the FBI name ISNA as one of 29 American Muslim organizations with ties to the Muslim Brotherhood. The Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt was a threat for a really, really long time. It blew up completely once Obama got into power because Obama is a Muslim sympathizer, if not a Muslim himself, okay? Let's put it on the table. He removed all those leaders that kept those bubbling feelings suppressed. Gaddafi, Libya is in a horrible state. He didn't really manage to do that in uh, Syria. And in Egypt, he brought down Mubarak, who was a great supporter to the United States. And by the way, the Egyptian regime was very uh, cooperative with the United States because of the threat of the Muslim Brotherhood. He removed Mubarak and the Muslim Brotherhood was obviously elected, just like Hamas was elected in Gaza. This is what happens when you give democracy in those states there that are heavily influenced by Islam. They want to expand. They want to grow because that's what they've been taught to do for the last 14,000 years or so, like a long time. Egypt managed to restore the secular government by, by taking over with, by using the army with a coup. So Egypt is back, Syria is busy, Libya is awful, everything is falling apart, Obama and Iran almost has nuclear weapons. When Obama was in power, I remember I was serving in the army and I didn't understand. There was a real attempt to bring down the government in, the, in Iran, the Ayatollahs, and Obama showed zero support. He supported the whole Arab world when they tried to bring down their governments. But when the people of Iran tried to bring down the government of the Ayatollahs, the Islamic government that they had, that they still have and suffer from, Obama? Where was he? Where was he? He said nothing. He ignored it. He, he pretended it didn't happen. Through the power of our diplomacy, a world that was once divided about how to deal with Iran's nuclear program now stands as one. Tom, will you sleep better tonight having heard that? <laughs> uh, I, may, I may take a sleeping pill so I can forget it. This, this man has diddled with Iran to the point where, where the military people are saying, you know, even if we decide to go in and, and bomb that place, they are so dispersed, so far underground, it's by no means clear that we can do it. The Parasitic Mind by Gad Sad. In it, there's a section in which the author presents research that analyzes the Islamic religion. Now, in the research that this book is citing, all the statements that contain Jew hatred were counted up and calculated, and it turned out Jew hate made up 9.3% of the writing. To put that into perspective, Mein Kampf by Adolf Hitler contained 7.4% Jew hate. That's less. You see, Muhammad was the first person who got insulted by the Jewish intellectuality not thinking he's their kind of guy. And he was very mad, very mad, especially the Jews, because every time he mentions Jews and Christians, Jews are first in that list. Jews, whatever religion, Christians. Jews, Christians, other religion. Jews, Christians, Jews, Christians. Always Jews first, because he really, really wanted the Jews to think that he's some sort of an intellectual. And the Jews were considered less like the smartest people. They had the book. They were the people of the book. So were the Christians. And Muhammad wanted them to accept him. Except Muhammad was just a violent, sadistic. When Jesus has brought to him the woman who is caught in adultery, and what does Jesus say when the crowd wanted to stone her for her sins? He says, he who is without sin cast the first stone, and the crowd go away. Now... In the Islamic tradition, a very, very similar thing happens when a woman is brought to Muhammad and he has her stoned. So, history of Christianity, more bloody or less bloody if Jesus was more like Muhammad? I think everyone would say likely to be more bloody. The only thing that he was really good at was like robbing people and looting and burning. And yeah, so it was not a match. Al-Quran, wal-Ahadith, wal-Kutub, al-Islamiyya. تحت عدسة مجهري توصلت إلى قناعة مطلقة 
لا يمكن لا يمكن أن يقرأ إنسان السيرة النبوية لمحمد ويؤمن بها ويخرج إلى الحياة إنسانا سليما معافى نفسيا وعقليا أنت تذكر الطريقة التي قتل بها السيدة عصماء بنت مروان عندما قطع أتباعه جسدها إربا إربا وهي ترضع طفلها والمشكلة عادوا إليه يكبرون فقال لا يتناطحوا بها عن زان أنت تعرف أن الماعز تتناطح لأتفه الأسباب ولكن عند محمد قتل امرأة مرضعة سبب أتفه من أن يتناطح به عن زان هل هذا نبي من عند الله؟ The Israeli population, the common Israeli, the citizens, today, they're in a state of shock. They thought that the Palestinians were peaceful people. You know, they thought that everything was going to be okay because they were giving Palestinian jobs. They were giving them everything. I mean, you name it, and the Palestinians were getting it. They, they, were, getting, they were getting education, they were getting clean water, they were getting medicines. They, were, they would come inside Israel and work. Apparently, it didn't work out too well for the Israelis. If an enemy wanted to make sure that Israel would come for them, the message would be, we're going to take children, women, innocents, and more, tie them up, and burn them alive, just like the Holocaust. They did it methodically. You hear it in the voices, the commands, the ease, the excitement of finding and mutilating victims being told, let them play with it. Merely murdering innocents was the least of it. The problem in the West, uh, and here I'll have to draw some distinctions because there's no uniform story yeah. here, but the problem broadly is that within a very, very short space of time, the shock that I think responsible people felt, the horror that we felt at the initial terrorist uh, attacks, has given way to a very carefully organized wave of protest uh, in support of the Palestinians. Uh, and this wave of protest has been seen as far afield as uh, Sydney, uh, London, and the campuses of elite universities, uh, including Stanford, where I'm based. Uh, now, this is remarkable, for example, to see 2,000 sociologists put their names to a petition uh, in solidarity with the Palestinian people against the so-called settler colonialism of Israel is astounding because where were these 2,000 sociologists in the 24 hours after October the 7th? Where was their statement of solidarity with the people of Israel who had been the victims of a horrendous terrorist atrocity, a kind of... The United States has been one of the greatest sources of progress that the world has ever known. I don't understand what's happened next. Like, the Japanese made you come in in Pearl Harbor? I guess when you did come in, finally, when you did come to this war and won, you got all the glory. You did nothing the whole time, almost, and then at the last moment, you got all the glory. And everybody forgot you funded Nazi Germany to begin with. And everybody forgot that the US didn't do what it had to do at all as a global power. 907 Jewish unfortunates without a country permitted to land in Belgium after five weeks of suspense afloat. Through American generosity, they will find at least temporary shelter in France. So what's the great plan, United States? Are you trying to drive out all the Jews from your country so that Israel will be stronger and fight this war for you? Just kind of like you did when you picked the Jews that would be able to develop the atom bomb for you and like threatened them? obviously, and didn't let any Jewish kids run away from Germany? Or is it just that you want us all to gather here so it'd be easier to nuke us? And maybe that's why Obama was so insistent in giving Iran nukes, even though it's obvious to everybody who lives here, and I would think everybody who has proper intelligence, that the moment they get nukes, they're going to nuke Israel. What is the plan here? What's the plan? Because obviously if Israel falls, you're next. There is no way around it. It's a pyramid scheme. That's, the, that's how it works. That's how Islam grows. Like, think you 
kind of understood that in 9-11. And then when you went in the Middle East, you realize you have no idea how to operate here. You have no understanding of this area. So why not sacrifice the Jews in Israel, right? That was always the plan anyway. And if you don't want to be a global power, that's okay. That's okay too. Just stop messing around here. Just let us do our thing, okay? Thank you. At least have a vision, you know? Unless you want to be Islamic or something. Maybe you want to be Islamic. Maybe, maybe that's the vision. Maybe you all want to be able to have slave girls and all that shit. Good luck. Good luck with that. You mentioned in Dismantling America such a point in foreign policy. Let me quote you, Tom. Iran is advancing step by step toward nuclear weapons while the Europeans wring their hands and the United Nations engages in leisurely discussion. When Osama bin Laden has nuclear weapons, the choice will be between knuckling under and watching American cities blasted off the face of the earth. That is the point of no return, and we are drifting toward it. Yes. Close quote. And they'd better create the impression that they have more plans. Because they, they've covered themselves very well, because they have international conferences over Iran, they have resolutions in the U.S. These, these, are, these are what I call elaborate ways of doing nothing. Saudi Arabia has indicated that the Israelis could fly over Saudi Arabia to get there. And it's ironic that they would have to go around Iraq and fly over Saudi Arabia because the American planes patrol Iraq and presumably would shoot down the Israeli planes on their way to Iran. Let me ask you this. Do you consider it then the duty of the President of the United States to prevent Iran from gaining nuclear... Absolutely. That's clear to you. Absolutely. I, 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 don't, I don't know what earthly uh, chance we have or the Western world has once Iran has those weapons. You know, it took what two weapons. Notion, what about this notion of, of uh, deterrence? It worked during the Cold War. Uh, yeah, the, 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 uh, the uh, Russians did not want us to blast Moscow off the map. The Iranians have said themselves, going back to the Ayatollah Khomeini, that, that their top priority is not Iran, but Allah. And so if they get into a war in which Iran is knocked out, but they then strike a blow for Allah, they're, 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 they're happy with that. And failing any serious sign that the United States would attack, would you say that it's the duty of the Prime Minister of Israel and his cabinet to order an attack? Oh, absolutely. It's, it's, uh, but uh, think, think of how pathetic this is, that uh, the fate of the United States of America would be in the hands of a country smaller than Lake Michigan. The government of Iran must recognize the gravity of the situation which it has itself created. But I am absolutely astonished by the absence of knowledge, indeed positive ignorance of almost every political statement made by, by most political figures in the West about it. People who before Iraq didn't know the difference between, between a Shia and a Sunni Muslim, uh, people who know nothing of the history of Iran. People in this country, for instance, do not know that in 1953 we overthrew uh, the legitimate government of Iran in pursuit of our own oil interests, something which is still usually resented there, and in my view, quite rightly. Uh, and this isn't some kind of conspiracy theory uh, fantasy. The details of it are available in, in, at the George Washington University in the American capital. Uh, the, the, the CIA have released the details of this putsch, which was organized by a, a man who later became a British conservative MP, Monty Woodhouse, and by the grandson of Theodore Roosevelt, President of the United States, a man called Kermit Roosevelt, who actually actually arranged and organized this thing and, and overthrew uh, Mohammed Mossadegh, who's Iran's legitimate prime minister, purely in pursuit of oil revenue. And the sad thing is, like, they're trying to do exactly the same thing in Israel. They're paying for those protests against the government. They want to have a puppet government, like they tried to have a puppet government in Iran and it blew up in their faces. In Israel, maybe they assume that the risk is lower, but it's the same thing. They want to basically overthrow the system in Israel so just they would be able to control Israel more. Because right now, it's hard to control the Israelis. And let me tell you something. Nope. I brought the message of Iranian people. I said to the leaders of Israel, I, lead, I said to the people of Israel, the people of Iran, message is this. We love you and we need you. And you need us. So let's work together in this common fight. We have to go to the root of the problem, which is Iranian regime. My message was this, don't be afraid to hit and target IRGC bases in Iran. Don't be afraid to hit and target nuclear sites of Iranian regime in Iran. 
don't be afraid to hit the house of high officials in Iran. That's how you can give support to Iranian people. In the very first meeting I had with Trump in the White House as president, I said to him, Donald, there are four peace treaties waiting to be plucked, ripe, you know, plums ready to be plucked off the tree. And I itemized the country. And he didn't buy it. He thought I was trying to evade the Palestinian track. And I said, okay, we'll try the Palestinian track. And we worked on that. And of course, we produced a template, which I think I think is very productive. But the Palestinians wouldn't come. Uh, just as Arafat couldn't make peace any more than he could fly to the moon, the present leadership can't do it because they'd have to give up what is really guiding the Palestinian national movement, which is not to build a state, but to destroy one, the Jewish state. So why do you, why do you think why do you think the Biden administration hasn't jumped on the Saudi Arabia opportunity, especially given that the Biden administration and the Americans in general would have benefited from closer relations with the Saudis, given the current state of energy? You describe. The first is the Palestinian straitjacket that says, and it still lingers among the foreign policy elites. I mean, they've been at it for Mm -hmm. Decades, they can't let it go. They say, well, no, right. no, you have to. Right. Peace means peace with the Palestinians. Peace in the Middle East is not in the Middle East. It's peace in the tiny part of the Middle East between Israel and the Palestinians. But peace with the entire Arab world, that's not peace. Uh, or you can't get to it before you, you know, you get through the 150-foot putt through the Iron Wall, which means you'll never get to it. Right, uh, right. So that's the lingering thing among the foreign policy. And it's maybe changing because the Abraham Accords sort of started shaking people up. Get it. It ain't personal, it's politics. And now the politics are basically saying that this whole attention diverting towards Israel is blowing up in your face because you try to demonize Israel all the time and undermine it so that the conflict would not get out of the boundaries of the Middle East. But that really now blowing up in your face because it's not a tool that is helpful to you anymore. Because once the people turn into Hamastan supporters and Taliban supporters, I'm sorry, it's the same thing. Okay, Hamas and Taliban and everything, it's all the same. Um, when the people turn to that, then that puts the United States in danger. I have to stand up for the Jewish people. And among my Arab and Muslim fellows, who are practicing so much anti-Semitism against them. I have seen how evil Hamas is with my own eyes, even when they were in Egypt, when they were targeting our soldiers in Sinai, how, how, how they don't care even about this Palestinian cause they are singing all the time, actually. They, they're only... Their only concern is their Islamic caliphate. So I know, I know how bad these Islamists are. So I thought, like, someone should speak up. I grew up in Lebanon, and it's no surprise then that many of the staunchest defenders of Western values end up being immigrants like myself, because we have, we have sampled from the wide buffet of possible societies. And we know that the, the Western experiment is not, it's an outlier, right? It's, it's an anomaly. And therefore, it, it typically takes people who did not grow up in a Western tradition, who've escaped the, the hell holes from which they've escaped, to then be able to say, hey, Westerners, don't take for granted the, the freedoms that you have. We forget that at the end of the day, life is a competition. And there, as we talked about last time, when you interviewed me the first time, I made this point. People in Russia and China are not sitting around doing identity politics. You're starting to see the Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, talked only days ago about how the purpose of what they're doing in Ukraine is to push America out of Eastern Europe and it is to end the American global dominance in the world. That's what people want. And make no mistake about it, they're coming for what we have. We don't live in some magical rainbow-colored world in which everyone wants to live happily and, and trade and whatever. Yes, that's part of it, but there are, there are a lot of people in the world who just want what we have, and they're coming. Uh, and, and, and so if you look at many of the, you know, think of Ayan Hirsi Ali, right? 1989, we were at a crossroads. 
and so many different people within the international relations scholarship were trying to figure out what is the world going to look like. And the one man, Professor Huntington, who talks about civilization and culture, that they're going to clash, they're going to compete, that non-Western civilizations like China, like Russia, like Islam, they would find somehow downplay their own differences and gang up on Western civilization. All of that is unfolding. Yeah. Yeah. How have we treated all of those other people who told us the truth? Look at this. There are 100,000 people three weekends in a row in London who are shouting. They're shouting, yelling, protesting for a genocide of the Jews. إنه صراع بين النقيدين إنه صراع بين زمنين إنه صراع بين العقلية التي تنتمي إلى القرون الوسطى والعقلية التي تنتمي إلى القرن الواحد والعشرين إنه صراع بين الحضاري الحضارة والتخلف بين المدنية والبدائية بين الهمجية والعقلانية إنه صراع بين الحرية والقمع بين الديمقراطية والدكتاتورية إنه صراع بين حقوق الإنسان من طرف واغتصاب تلك الحقوق من طرف آخر إنه صراع بين من يعامل المرأة كالبهيمة وبين من يعاملها كالإنسان ما نراه ليس صراعا بين الحضارات الحضارات لا تتصارع الحضارات تتنافس يعني not obvious that history will be kind to the good it's not true History has been kind to the bad. History has been kind to the worst people. I mean, the uh, Genghis Khan ruled, <laughs> ruled a good chunk of the world for over a century and created horrible, you know, terrible horrors. Rising anti-Semitism is rarely the lone or the last manifestation of intolerance in a society. Quite the contrary, it is often the canary in the coal mine for the degradation of human rights more broadly. you. The end. Like, subscribe, comment.